Um, uh, Lewis called himself the most reluctant convert. I sometimes think of myself as the most reluctant evangelist. Um, when I first started doing some work together with the C.S. Lewis Institute, um, I suggested that we print up my business card to say um, evangelistic chicken. Um, but instead they, they said, no, let's have you be senior teaching fellow. It's much more impressive. Um, but it doesn't change my reluctance or my difficulty. I, I'm a fellow struggler with, in the world of evangelism. I hope that that's an encouragement to you. Um, so this is a workshop on how do evangelistic chickens do evangelism. And what can we learn from C.S. Lewis in this process of evangelism? Um, my hope is that this workshop wouldn't just be that we'd learn some more things about C.S. Lewis, um, but this would actually propel us and help us to be more bold, more equipped, more uh, faithful, and by God's grace, perhaps more fruitful in evangelism. Um, just to begin, I hope you're encouraged by the fact that C.S. Lewis was not what we typically think of as an evangelist, right? Um, I think most of us have images of either people standing on street corners and preaching rather loudly and boldly, or the kinds of people who just can't resist and, and must share the gospel all the time, right? Um, I spent many years with Campus Crusade, and we had quite a few speakers who would always talk about how they, they had to witness on airplanes. Apparently, that's where all evangelism must take place, <laughs> high up, close to heaven or something. And, and they would always say that they had to. And I always thought, well, yeah, but that just makes me feel guilty because I didn't. And I remember one guy speaking one time saying, I cannot sleep at night unless I've witnessed to one soul that day. And I just felt really terrible thinking, ah, I'm sleeping okay, buddy. Um, <laughs> So, but, but, so I hope you're encouraged by the fact that Lewis was a different kind of evangelist, or maybe even a non-evangelist that God used in miraculously evangelistic ways. Um, he himself saw that he was not the, the bold evangelist and that he should be part of a team. I think uh, this has already been mentioned. Um, but Lewis talked about the fact that, that he went after the head stuff, but he wished he could do the heart stuff. Um, there's one place where he was talking um, about his whole idea, and he said, I'm not sure that the ideal missionary team ought not to consist of one who argues and then one who, in the fullest sense of the word, preaches. Put up your arguer first to undermine their intellectual prejudices, and then let the evangelist proper launch his appeal. I have seen this done with great success. So all that to say is my, my first introductory thought is um, God uses all sorts of different kinds of people in the evangelistic enterprise, not just the bold evangelist who preaches on the street corner or the person who can't not witness. He uses all of us, I believe, in this process. And my guess is if we were to go around this room and hear people's individual stories, you would all, I think, point to a number of different people who God used in, your, in the process of your coming to faith. And they weren't all what you typically think of as evangelists. Some people were friends who just really cared for you, and some people argued about some specific intellectual issue and a whole wide variety. So that's all introductory. Um, the first a lesson that I think that we must learn from C.S. Lewis about evangelism is that evangelism includes prayer. That this enterprise of people coming to faith, coming out of darkness and into light, um, is this supernatural, almost inexplicable combination of what God does in waking people from the dead, opening up blind eyes, softening hardened hearts, and also what God uses through other people, speaking, asking questions, engaging in conversations, the very, very natural and the very, very supernatural. Um, Lewis, one time uh, speaking about this bit about um, prayer and the role that it has in evangelism, he wrote to someone and said, I have two lists of names in my prayers those for whose conversion I pray, and those for whose conversion I give thanks. The little trickle of transference from list A to list B is a great comfort. 
So my first point is, do you have those two lists? Do you have a list of people for, whom, for whose conversion you are praying? Um, Paul told us in Colossians 4 to devote ourselves, to remain steadfast in prayer. And then he spoke about um, the role of uh, the weaving together of prayer and evangelism. So I want to begin by giving you a few moments to jot down names of non-Christians that you are praying for. Maybe they're people you've been praying for for decades. Maybe they're people that you've quit praying for because you ran out of uh, stamina. Maybe they're people who you've never prayed for, but it, now you're realizing, oh, wait a minute, God has brought some non-believers into my life, and I need to put them on that prayer list. So let me give you a few moments. Jot down the names of the non-believers that God has sovereignly placed in your life, and then we'll pray for them. And then we'll dig in for a few more lessons about what we can learn about evangelism. Let me also invite you to jot down um, places or spheres where you're likely to meet some non-believers. In other words, maybe you, don't, maybe you haven't met your neighbors yet, but you could write down neighborhood, or workplace, or the gym. Jot those down as well and ask God to work in those places to connect you with non-believers. Now, I, wa I want to quickly acknowledge to you, uh, um, I wrestle with this deeply. I do have lists of uh, people that I'm praying for who are non-believers, um, but I, I regularly have to reconstruct the list because I, I lose them, and I misplace them, and I, and I forget them. And if I'm honest, I'm very reluctant to pray these prayers because I'm pretty confident that God will answer them. And, and then I'll have to talk and say things and, and evangelize. I told you I was a reluctant evangelist. And it's too late. We've locked the doors. You can't leave. Some of you are going, I came to a seminar on evangelism by a guy who's reluctant. What am I doing here? Too late. Ha ha. Um, so, um, but, so I spent a lot of time um, praying for these people on these lists and these places. And I also pray for myself. Lord, would you work in me so that I'm more willing? Would, would you work in me so that your glory is more important than my comfort. I spent a lot of time mixing confession of sin in with this prayer of, Lord, I don't really care about people the way you want me to. Would you work in me and change me? So let's pray. Take a look at those lists that you have in front of you, the places, the people, and let's ask God to work. Our Father and our God, it is no mistake that you've placed these people in our lives. And it is no mistake that you use people in this process of leading people out of darkness into light. It's, it's amazing to us that you would use reluctant, timid, sinful, self-centered people like me in this process of leading people to salvation. Would you work in those people's hearts now? Would you make your gospel irresistible to them? Would you give them a dissatisfaction with their life as it is right now? Would you give them a, a hunger for eternity? And we reluctantly but boldly pray that you would use us in the process of their coming to faith. We pray this in the amazing, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. I have uh, five lessons. I hope I get to all five that I think we can learn from C.S. Lewis about evangelism. I think there's a whole lot more, and then I'll try to save some time for questions afterwards and do my best to answer. Um, the first lesson, well, we've already talked about that there's all sorts of different kinds of evangelists and that prayer uh, evangelism involves prayer, but now um, one very important lesson, I think, that we can learn from C.S. Lewis is that there may be some great advantages of moving gradually. It may be, in many cases, to move incrementally along in presenting people the gospel. Um, I think if you read through Mere Christianity, for example, and you remember that Lewis was delivering these as 15-minute radio broadcasts in uh, kind of a, a gradual way, that you can realize that he thought through, now what, what, are, what are some preliminary issues that people have to 
latch on to before I can move to the pointed message of Jesus dying on the cross. So for example, at the very end of the very first part of the very first radio broadcast ends in this way. You remember Lewis started by saying um, that this is called right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. And he comes to the end of this first 15 minute broadcast and he said, these then are the two points I wanted to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and they cannot really get rid of it. Secondly, that they do not in fact behave in that way. And then he had a few more statements about that and then that was the end of the radio broadcast. And I imagine some of us might say, well, he never got to Jesus and he never got to the cross and he didn't talk about atonement for sin. No, not yet. Stay tuned. I think more and more in our world today, we need to be thinking of this incremental thing. I really hope you'll hear me carefully, and there's no one formula for it, but we need wisdom and guidance from the Lord about where people are at. And there may be some preliminary issues that they need to wrestle with. How do we know anything? Um, how do we know about if there is a God. Lewis began his thinking is, we all have heard people arguing about what's right and what's wrong. Hey, you can't take that, that's my seat. Well, if there is a right and a wrong, then maybe there's a lawgiver who declares what's right and wrong. That's very pre-pre-pre-evangelism. And so I think for a lot of us, we need to grow in our understanding of and appreciation of and our skill at pre-evangelism. Um, um, here's how I like to um, uh, illustrate it sometimes when I'm doing seminars on evangelism. I hope this will work. If you can imagine here in a, a line uh, extended, uh, suspended in midair with the alphabet on it. So, so moving from A to Z. Got it? Can you visualize that? All right. And so I, I tend to think of this as a spectrum of unbelief. So, I'm going to move around a bunch and drive the cameraman crazy, um, but so Z over here is someone who's really ready to become a Christian. They've heard it, they've thought about it, they wrestled, they got their questions answered, they've been reading the Bible. They just need someone to say, have you ever placed your trust in Jesus? And they say, no. I said, would you like to right now? Well, yes, I would. And so Z is, yes, and they become, and, and, and the hallelujah chorus breaks out. And uh, so Z is, I'm ready to become a Christian. But A may be the most hardened, angry, militant atheist you can imagine, which is kind of where C.S. Lewis was in his younger days. Okay. So we, we want to, where people, everybody that we meet is somewhere on this spectrum somewhere. And a lot of us think of evangelism down on this end of the spectrum from T to Z. There's a whole lot of evangelistic strategies and training things that go T U V W X Y Z. And that's, that's a great strategy if the person we're talking to is already at letter T. Are you following this? You make, so, so sometimes um, some of us have been through training uh, uh, episodes or, or training exercises where we've been told that the, the way to begin an evangelistic conversation is by saying to someone, if you were to die tonight, how sure are you that you'd go to heaven? You've heard this? Or maybe it's expanded a little bit. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and he were to say, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Well, that's a great question for someone who's already kind of on this end of the spectrum. That question assumes they already believe in God, they believe in heaven, they would want to go to heaven. They believe that this God is a personal God who could ask them a question and that something they would say would make a difference. Our whole culture, at least in America and Western Europe, has shifted rather dramatically and there's a whole lot more people on this side of things who, if you were to ask them if you were to die tonight, that's just a weird question for a whole lot of people over here. Um, I come from a Jewish background and, and uh, Jewish people have this, sort of this superstition of you don't say bad things, you don't talk about them because then they're likely to happen. 
I'm, I'm serious, this is deep in the marrow of the Jewish bones of anybody from uh, Eastern European ancestry. And so if I were to say to any of my Jewish relatives, if you were to die tonight, they'd shh, quiet, what do you, shut up, what is your problem? What are you always talking about dying tonight? What is, like, stop, trying to sell me life insurance, what's your problem? Okay, so it's not a good starter question if people are over here at letter D. It's a great question over here. But I think Lewis was looking at his audience who was going to be hearing on the radio. He thought, you know, I think they're over here. Or at least I better not assume they're. And let's talk about how, how do we know anything? How do we know right and wrong? Common ground. Is this making sense? So what we want is a bunch of strategies to think through how do we move from where people are gradually moving in this way. Um, in one place, Lewis talked about how his approach was, uh, I'm calling it pre-evangelism, um, he uh, chose Latin words. And whenever you're trying to really impress people, you use Latin. Um, I just don't know it. But he wrote, mine are preparatorio evangelica. Pre-evangelism, preparatory for the proclaiming of the gospel, rather than evangelism an attempt to convince people that there is a moral law, that they disobey it, and that the existence of a lawgiver is at least very probable, and also, unless you add the Christian doctrine of the atonement, that this imparts despair rather than comfort. Now, so, so I want to I maintain a very, very tight definition of what is evangelism. Evangelism is the verbal proclaiming of the specific message that Jesus died to pay the price for sins. But there's a whole lot of pre-evangelism that we need to become good at to set up for evangelism. So, um, we want to be willing to move gradually. We want to be, part of this is starting with common ground, understanding where people are, and, and, and saying things like, um, well, we've all heard people arguing about right and wrong, so that's a common ground. Let's acknowledge uh, that kind of thing. Part of this pre-evangelism also, I think, is trying to give people places where they can engage with those issues. So you may know that Lewis started something at Oxford called the Socratic Club. And, and it was very pre-pre-pre-evangelistic. People would come in and they would hear a talk by a Christian about a topic, about the Bible, or did Jesus really rise from the dead, or is there such a thing as a moral law? And then other, he would, they would also allow non-Christians to present papers. And so some weeks when they gathered, you only heard a non-Christian. Now, does that, does that make you break out in hives a little bit? Like, really? You would just allow that? Well, sure. So we want to have spaces and places where people can raise questions and discuss things. And we want to value the pre-evangelistic part, um, both in content and in tone. We want to have a place where Christians can say things, uh, non-Christians can say things, and Christians would say, well, I, I think I understand that point. I think uh, there's, some, uh, there's some reasons for that. Um, if you've ever um, heard recordings of C.S. Lewis, he did have a, a style of communicating, a tone that was very welcoming, and uh, even at some points rather gentle. Um, we need to become really good at that. And it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult to do so. I'm, I'm, I'm sure this isn't a, a, a shocking statement, but our society is becoming louder, meaner, more polarized, more angry. Um, and so it is easy just to jump on to some of that reactionary, angry, sarcastic, um, there needs to be a way for us to be um, winsome, gentle, to use the term in 1 Peter 3.15. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, a shopping center near where I live uh, in Northern Virginia um, called the Mosaic District, and uh, they have uh, the, uh, very, very big walls with different um, artwork and uh, um, quotes and pictures. 
Um, and I, I saw one once, a very, very nice picture, very kind of artistic picture of a person, a very a happy person. And there's a quote by a, a poet, uh, Gil Scott Heron. Do any of you know that name? He's kind of a performance poet uh, quite a long time ago. And, and the quote is, you're so very beautiful when you are who you are. Now, my first thought when looking at that, being the sarcastic, cynical New Yorker that I am, my first thought is, how does he know? He doesn't even know me. You are so very beautiful when you are who you are. Really? He doesn't even know me. That's ridiculous. My first was, was attack and negative. No, that's, that's humanism. That's secular humanism. That's just wrong. The Bible says we're desperately wicked. Jeremiah, they should put Jeremiah 17 up there instead. <laughs> Well, you could do that, and that, that's, that, that's a style of evangelism. Uh, may the Lord bless you. Um, um, I, th I think Lewis wanted to try to find things that, that people would resonate with and then also talk about the other side. In other words, I, I think as I read the chapter on hope in mere Christianity, it seems to me that Lewis wanted to affirm good news and bad news, or um, good things about the human experience and then also the terrible things about human experience. It seems to me that if I, if I could be standing with a non-believer and we saw that, that quote, I, I think I, I, rather than my, my first response that you got to hear, I, I might like to say, huh, you know, you can be so very beautiful when you are who you are. And I would say, sometimes that's true. But sometimes it's, you can be so very horrible when you are who you are. I know that's true for me. Isn't that amazing that the same person can be so very beautiful and so very ugly? At least that's true for me. Sometimes within seconds of each other. There's something in us as people created in the image of God that really is rather beautiful. And there's something in us because of the fall, because of our rebellion, because of our sin that's so very, very horrible. And I, I think Lewis tried to say those kinds of things in ways as, as pre-evangelism of weaving together the good news and the bad news. Um, this quote in um, the Hope chapter of Mere Christianity may be one of the most important things that I read as a non-believer and that the Lord used in my coming to faith. I, was, uh, I grew up Jewish. I, I looked to Judaism as some kind of, of resolution or meaning or purpose or satisfaction, and it was terribly disappointing. I gave up on that, I went off to college, and music be became my god. I was a music major, and I thought music was going to be the satisfaction. I was going to, one of those Saturday nights, I was going to take the subway downtown to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra at the Academy of Music, and I was going to hear some piece of music that was going to be it. It was going to be the satisfaction. It was, ah, finally I found the piece of music that was ecstasy. And, and there were times that I thought I found it. I do remember uh, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, and I thought, oh, that, that's just so amazing. But then the piece ended, and I had to leave the theater and go back outside and take the subway back up to North Philadelphia, and that's a whole different experience than <laughs> Swan Lake. And then I thought it was Petrushka by Stravinsky, and then oh, pretty much anything by Dvorak, and, um, but it was always a disappointment. And then I came along to uh, uh, wrestling with who Jesus was and reading the New Testament, and then um, somewhere in that I read Mere Christianity, and Lewis wrote this, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts would know that they do want, and want acutely, something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. 
the longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of, so, of some foreign country or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. I am not now speaking of what would be ordinarily called unsuccessful marriages or holidays or learned careers. I'm speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we grasped at at that first moment of longing which just fades away in the reality. I think everyone knows what I mean. The wife may be a good wife, and the hotels and scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may be a very interesting job. But something has evaded us. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how different ways we could handle it, and then you probably know that, that important quote that says, um, uh, if, the, if there's no desire in this world that satisfies me, it, the most probable explanation is that I was meant for another world. And I think we need to find a way in our evangelism of, of affirming that longing that people have in their job or a relationship or music or art or something and say, it, 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 it's close, isn't it? But it's also disappointing. So all of that, I think, is valuing pre-evangelism and moving gradually and, and engaging and affirming the positive things about being created in the image of God. That was a long first point. Second one, um, we need to engage the imagination in our talking about what it means to become a believer. We certainly need to engage the intellect, and C.S. Lewis was very, very good at that. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with where he talks about that Jesus made some claims that if he really made those things that we can't believe he was just a good teacher. Um, the, the kind of person who made those kind of claims would either be a lunatic on the level of someone who calls himself a poached egg or else he would be the Lord himself. So Lewis engaged in the intellect for sure and he said here's what Jesus said and he made these comments and whatever. But Lewis also gave people imaginative pictures of what it would be to become a Christian. He didn't just argue for becoming a Christian, he gave people pictures of what that would feel like or what that would look like. Um, uh, you may know the name Michael Ward. Michael Ward has done quite a bit of study about Lewis's imaginative evangelism and he came up with this long list of how Lewis gives pictures of what it's like to become a Christian. See, see, there's, there's arguments about here's what it means to become a Christian, and here's why you should become a Christian, here's arguments in favor of it, and I'm all in favor of all of that. But he also said, here's what it's like, and just listen to some of these things. Again, Michael Ward condensed so many different things, he compiled them. I, there's a list of 30 of them, I won't read all of them, but just to give you an idea, Becoming a Christian, according to Lewis, is like joining in a campaign of sabotage. It's like falling at someone's feet. It's like putting yourself in someone else's hands. It's like taking on board fuel or food. It's like laying down your rebel arms and surrendering. It's like saying you're sorry, laying yourself open turning full, full speed astern. You can see it, can't you? You can feel it. <laughs> it's like killing part of yourself. It's like learning to walk or learning to write. It's like buying God a present with his own money. It's like a drowning man clutching at a rescuer's hand. It's like a tin soldier or a statue becoming alive. And on and on and on it goes. Isn't that great? Yeah. So that what you do is you don't just say, okay, let me give you five reasons why you should believe this is true. And I hope you're hearing me. There's great value in that too. I'm not saying don't do that. I, we need all of that apologetic uh, toolbox that we can possibly marshal. Yes, yes, yes. But you also want to say, Here's what it feels like. Now, let me give you a moment. Were, were, were there any that I listed that you particularly resonate with? I want you to jot them down. Or I want to give you a minute to try to think, what, 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 
what was it, what did it feel like for me to become a Christian? So take a moment and try to jot down some of those pictures. I'll just do one more, by the way. One of my favorites, Lewis described his experience of becoming a Christian feeling like um, someone who wakes up and gradually just realizes at some point, oh, I'm awake. Does that work for you? Does that, uh... So, jot down some possible ones. So, one, one is move gradually. Two is engage the imagination. Third is um, anticipate challenges. Anticipate the kinds of questions people are likely to raise, and then you raise them. It's a preemptive strike. There's something I think, I, I, I don't totally under, I haven't studied rhetoric officially, but you gain a certain kind of advantage when you raise the objection before they do. So, the, the biggest one, or one that stands out in my mind, is um, the objection that Lewis anticipated and addressed of people say Jesus was just a good teacher. So people will say, well, he was just a good teacher, uh, taught a lot of good things about love, um, it's perhaps his, one of his most famous quotes. I, I already alluded to it about the man who calls himself a poached egg. But then Lewis says, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now, so I want you to see Lewis anticipated and stated what people would say. Now, some people will say he was a good teacher or whatever, but, and then he saved the real punch of let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense until he had kind of paved the way for it. Some of us want to jump in with that a little too soon. So we wait for them to raise the objection. Well, you know, I think Jesus was just a good moral teacher. And we go, that's patronizing nonsense. <laughs> or something uh, equally as effective. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend it. And I can tell you, I'm sad to say, from experience, it doesn't work very well. So, I think we need to think through what are the challenges people are saying today. We need to anticipate them. We need to voice them in a very kind way and then say, now here are some of the problems with that. And I, I want to warn you, it takes a tremendous amount of patience. Uh, probably, well, it's more than I have and I'm going to guess more than many of us in this room have. And so the whole time that we're arguing, if I can use that word, we're asking God, would you give me kindness? Would you give me gentleness? So, what are the challenges that you can anticipate in our day and age? I, I certainly think we need to be ready and to think through about when people raise, well, I think all religions are basically the same. I mean, come on. All religions, if you really... Uh, boil them down, they come down to a few things about being nice to one another, don't they? I mean, isn't that what all religions are about? And that's what people will say. And, and now, we believe that's wrong. At least I do. I'm pretty sure you do here at this conference. We No, that's not true. They're not the same. But we need to be careful that we don't just pounce on that. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be violating their one big thing. Is you're supposed to be nice, and you're not being nice to me right now. So we need to be able to say, well, I, you know, I understand why you would think that. And in fact, a lot of religions do have a lot of those common themes. We want to affirm as much as we can when people are saying things that are true. And a lot of religions do have a lot of commonality. So yes. But you know, if you dig into them, you find actually 
Well, they really differ on some very, very big points. So yeah, they do have some commonality, but at their core, they're disagreeing about some very, very important things. By the way, a little commercial, um, you might appreciate um, the, arg the line of argument of um, a, re a religious studies professor up at Boston University, Stephen Prothero. He's not a believer, not a Christian, not even adherent to any one particular religion, but he's a religious studies professor who kind of um, uh, yelled about uh, the, the emperor's new clothes uh, several years ago when he wrote a book um, saying that um, the different religions of the world are not the same. That kind of argument, all religions are basically the same, they're just different paths up the same mountain, was, was the prevailing view in the religious studies world for probably 100 years in American academic uh, institutions. And one particular textbook that was the most frequently used textbook argued that thing about the different uh, paths up the same mountain. And Prothero, as this scholar, not adherence, was the first one to say, you know, that's really not true. If you study those religions, they're, they're not different paths up the same mountain. In fact, they're not even on the same mountain, Prothero says. So, so you need to be able to say, you know, I understand why people think that, and there are a lot of external things, but at their core, they disagree. Prothero says it's actually insulting. It's not just wrong to say that Buddhism and Judaism teach the same thing. It's insulting to both, both Buddhists and Jewish people to say that they believe the same thing. It's insulting to Muslims and Christians to say you believe the same thing. So, but you've got to find ways to say this in kind, uh, gentle ways, anticipating the objection. Okay, let me do two more and then we'll see if we have, I'll, I'll answer some questions. Um, but so, um, we want to engage the imagination, we want to anticipate the questions that they're going to ask. Um, uh, next point, fourth, I think I'm at four, am I at four? I hope so. Um, um, we want to beware of the temptation to soft sell our gospel, to make it so reasonable and so appealing that we never get around to the hard edges of the gospel. We do want to be winsome. We want to be gentle. We want to be respectful. All of that is biblical. I believe that's what 1 Peter 3.15 says. We want to build gradually, but there is the hard... Um, um, unwelcome, unwanted stumbling block of the cross that says we're all so sinful we can't save ourselves. And that our sin is so bad that God had to send His Son to die for us. And that's offensive. And so we need to be, be beware of, of pulling back from that too much. Yes, there, sure, there's times to move gradually, but if, if I can go back to that A to Z scale, some of us might say, well, I, I really like the D to E part. I'm, I'm really good at that, and, and some of us do. But in many cases, sooner or later, you want to get around to T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z, Jesus died for you. Again, we're trying to learn from C.S. Lewis. You may remember, toward the end of uh, mere Christianity, he says, if we let him, God, for we can prevent him if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthiest, filthiest of us into a god or goddess, a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine, a bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though of course on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. That's the good part. Yeah, amen, I like it. The process will be long, and in parts, very painful. But that is what we are in for, nothing less. So we want to tell people, it's wonderful to become a Christian. You, 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 you get forgiveness of sins. You have eternal life. You can face death with confidence. You can get through difficult trials. But we also need to say to people, God will work on you and do things to make you more like Jesus that might be very, very painful. 
you will have to say no to some things that you've done for a very long time that you like. There may be some things that you have to repent of, and repentance is never fun. So we just need to be aware that, and, and for all of us, some of us more than others, some of us are far more timid, some of us are more wanting, needing people's approval. By, by the way, there, there's dangers for all personality types. Some of us really like to be liked by people, um, and we, we want them to like us, and so we shy away. Others of us like to be more forceful than we need to be sometimes. We like to win. So you need to know who you are or what particular mood you're in that day and ask God to make you the spokesperson he wants you to be. And for some of us, that means, okay, I, I need to not back away from this. This is all very uncomfortable, isn't it? Just got about 10 degrees hotter in the room, didn't it? I uh, hope he's finished soon. Yes, I am. So uh, all I have to say is we need to beware of, of the temptation to soft sell. If, if you've been talking to people for a very long time and they really like it and you have these great conversations and they talk about, oh, yeah, I got this Christian fan, he's great, or whatever, and, and there's never been the, ooh, wait a minute, this got uncomfortable, then maybe it's time to push it a little bit further. Um, again, I come from a Jewish background, and with uh, witnessing to Jewish people, it moves to that uncomfortable thing pretty early on. <laughs> like within seconds, oh, you're Jewish and you believe in Jesus? Get out of here. Oh, how'd we, how'd we get there so fast? And um, I've learned a great deal from reading and listening to uh, Moish Rosen, who is the founder of Jews for Jesus. I really did uh, learn a great deal from him. And I heard him speaking one time, and he talked about the fact that wherever he goes, he speaks in a lot of churches, um, and he would meet pastors. And, and many of the pastors would say to him, oh, I have this great relationship with the rabbi in my community. We get together for lunch, and we got, we got this great relationship. And he'd say, well, how long have you known? Oh, 15 years. And uh, Rosen would say, is this a stupid rabbi or a stupid pastor? Now, he was pretty blunt in there. Some of you were really offended by that. I'm sorry. But, but, but really? You've known the guy for 15 years and he's still your buddy? Have you talked about Jesus? Because at some point, this is... Yeah. Now you're even more uncomfortable, huh? Sorry. Okay. Maybe in the second rendition of this, I won't quote the Moish Rosen. Make a note here. Okay, sorry. No, I... I I, I regularly need to pray, uh, I've already mentioned this, but I, I regularly need to confess, Lord, make me less in love with my comfort than with the bold proclamation of the gospel. Okay, one last point, and that is, as if this isn't uncomfortable enough, here we go, um, prepare for persecution. Lewis um, got into a whole lot of trouble for going to the radio and writing... Um, uh, children's books that were uh, Christian in tone. He got into trouble in his academic world at Oxford for being a uh, uh, preacher and a, uh, an evangelist on a pop level. And it actually cost him his job. He didn't exactly get fired, but he got passed over so many times for an advancement that it became rather obvious that they didn't like him there. And the reason why Lewis finished his career at Cambridge instead of Oxford is because Oxford was kind of tired of this guy who's sort of bringing embarrassment to the academic world, but Cambridge thought, wait a minute, this, we, we got to go for this guy. And they offered him a great job because they saw his academic excellence. But Lewis kind of lost his job because he was a Christian. And all of us are going to, if we haven't already, are going to face some really, really difficult things. If you take stands for Christian views in our world today, some of you will lose jobs and lose friends and not get promotions. And we need to be so um, confident of the truth of the gospel and in love with what the Lord has done for us, in us, that those other things pale into less significant. Now, I, I, again, I, I know that this is terribly difficult and painful, but it is the reality that Christians have always faced, and uh, we're going to see more and more of it. Sorry to end on such a bad note. 
I will tell you that um, Lewis, for me, um, convinced me of both the, the truthfulness and the goodness of the gospel. Um, I saw people who knew God in a personal way and I was attracted to it, and so I read the Gospel of Matthew, because that's what they encouraged me to read, and that convinced me, wait a minute, this guy isn't just a good teacher. He isn't who my rabbi told me he would be. He, he claimed to be God, and so I got convinced intellectually by reading uh, Matthew that Jesus was the Messiah. But Lewis convinced me how very good that is and how, how all of those disappointments of the musical experiences or the relationships or the experiences of other kinds um, were pointers to something far better. And so Lewis, for me, transformed those disappointments into joy, just like he said. They were disappointments, but, but the disappointment was so desirable that it was better than actually having the fulfillment. And so every one of those pointers now is, oh yeah, that's right, that's not ultimate. So I love Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake and everything Dvorak ever wrote. And every time I listen to it, instead of hoping, gee, this is going to be ultimate, no, 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 it's secondary, and oh, what a delight. And so some of your non-Christian friends, the people whose names you jotted down, they're looking to other things, and those other things are terrible disappointments. And you can introduce them to the one who will make those second things second, and they'll be better as a second thing instead of as a first. Amen? Amen. So do you have some questions? I think we have about 10 minutes. I can try to answer questions. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Stephen Prothero, P-R-O-T-H-E-R-O. It's a book. I'm pretty sure the title is uh, God is Not One. Um, you can find an article length uh, presentation of his argument online, so that'll save you the money of the book. Or you can just read the introduction to the book, which I think is the very best part of the book. Um, no, I. I oh, that was. <laughs> It's a good book all the way through, but, but you get the gist of his argument in the introduction. Why, why I, that was trouble. Anyway, so anyway, Stephen Prothero. So now, yes, sir. You were, you were saying about the question of if you stand before God and he asks you, why should let you into heaven? Uh, my sense is that the vast majority of people, including a lot of church people, would say I would tell him I was a good person. And, uh, you, and so they don't want to hear anything different from that for you, that they're good people. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how to uh, respond to that assumption? That sure. Did you all hear? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll repeat it anyway. Um, so let's say you do get to the appropriate time to say, if you were to die tonight, how sure are you that you go to heaven and why? And if the person says, well, I've been a good person. So what do we say then? Because, because to say to them, well, not good enough, um, might not be the smoothest uh, technique. But that is where you want to get them. So, so it's the, um, OK, so you're a good person. That's good to hear. Um, um, let's see now. How, how, how good do you think you have to be to get to heaven? Um, well, or do, well, do you believe in heaven? Yes. Do you believe everybody goes to heaven? Most people would say no. If they need a little prompting, throw Hitler at them. Do you think Hitler's in heaven? No, okay, so some people don't make it, all right. Do you believe in hell? That may take a little work, but a lot of people do, even though they're uncomfortable about it. Well, do you think anybody goes to hell? Yeah, okay, so who decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Um, people sooner or later will say God, and then how is God going to make that decision? In other words, it's a process of presenting the law to them so that they realize they don't match. Then we quote, well, you know, Jesus talked about that um, you've heard don't commit murder, but if anyone says you fool, or hates someone, well, that's like murder. Oh. So, so what we want to do is, well, uh, so we don't want to say, 
oh, no, you're not good. Um, what we want to say is, are, is anyone really good enough? Um, but it, it takes, takes a back and forth kind of discussion. It's not an instantaneous quick thing. Um, I've learned some things from Bill Hybels about uh, evangelism, maybe you know, and he has a pretty famous talk where he, where he talks to people about what their standard of righteousness is. And, and there was a period of time, and this is probably still true for a lot of people, their standard has always been Mother Teresa. And so he has this favorite Mother Teresa quote where she says that she thinks she's terribly sinful. I'm like, really? Yeah, so Mother Teresa thought she was really sinful. So if she's... Now, where are you in relation to Mother Teresa? Oh. <laughs> Mother Teresa needs something other... What? I, what? I'm missing my own jokes. This is really <laughs> terrible. Is that, okay. Um, so um, uh, Mother Teresa needs something other than the goodness of Mother Teresa to get into heaven. We all do. By the way, I, I really encourage you to think through these things and try them out on your own and practice them. Very few of us, none of us, or you know, I'm sorry, there are a few, but very, very few of us are brilliant on the spot. So we need to think through and prepare. How will, how will we respond to these things? Okay, other questions? Yes. Randy, are there... I think there are some people that are just harder to get than others. I have a dear friend, a, a lady I've been praying for 20 years. She's Baha'i. She can use everything. You know, every, every objection, you know, she's prayed to send prayer, and then she goes, and I love Muhammad. You know, so it's, it, are there resources that can actually help you reach different religions? Or how come I got such tough, a toughie? <laughs> well, there are people who are tougher, and there are people who don't respond. And there are people who tragically won't respond. I mean, there are people who came to Jesus and had conversations with him, and they didn't respond. You remember the, the rich man who really thought he was righteous. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Quotes, I've kept all these commandments. And then a little bit of an interchange between Jesus and the man about what really is good, and the man went away sad. So there are people who are tougher. And Jesus even told us that um, it's, it's very, very difficult for people who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's tougher for some than others. And, and there are people who are wealthy in their own moral goodness that are tougher. I mean, people who've really messed up their lives and been cruel and been arrested and spent time in jail, it, it's a quicker, you know, you, you're sinful. Yeah, I know. Okay, but for people who are good people, never been arrested, never, never even gotten a speeding ticket. I mean, you know, they're really good people. That's a tougher one. So yes, there are tougher. So we just need to acknowledge that. Um, and so maybe there's some people who we need to be praying more diligently for. Um, I don't mean this as a simplistic thing, but the sooner we can get people reading the scriptures, the better. The sooner we can confront them with the Jesus in the New Testament, not our explanation of him, or stories, or whatever. The, the, there's, well, there's, there's a truthfulness of the scriptures for sure, but there's also a power there. It cuts through. And so many people's testimonies will be, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I read the Bible and I went, whoa, wait a minute. This is totally different than I thought it was going to be. And, Oh, he's so much greater than I thought he was, and I'm so much more messed up than, whoa. So, so the sooner you can get people to see, okay, you probably thought the New Testament is probably like all sorts of other books, and you've read all sorts of books. Okay, let's, let's read the Gospel of John together. Look at this, look at this. Look at how he was so surprising and different and outrageous at times and and holy and, and look at the kind of people who came to him. So the sooner you can get them into the scripture, and, and there are some really good evangelistic Bible studies. I'm thinking of uh, Christianity Explored is a very, very good one. We all need to have kind of a whole list in our mind of, of a number of different evangelistic and pre-evangelistic tools. Um, and because there's a whole wide range of people that we meet. Um, I don't think there's any one book that's going to connect with everyone. I love mere Christianity, and I do give it to some people, but I also realize Lewis 
is difficult for a lot of people to read today, especially today because of time. So I also like Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, but it's, it's pretty intellectually rigorous. So there are some people who can't get past the intro. Other people, oh, they, they latch onto it right away. Um, but I'm, try, I'm stuck now. I'm trying to think of something that leads people into the Bible in particular. Um, I mentioned Christianity Explored. There is kind of a, a study guide that I think is a good starter. Anybody got some suggestions about, in other words, something that opens the Bible to them so that they can dig, get into it? Um, I'm, not, I'm, not so sure that we, I'm not so sure that we need to shy away from just, well, how about if we were to read the Gospel of Mark together and we sit down and let's, let's read a chapter? Um, and, and, and if it's difficult for them, well, okay, so, well, here, let me tell you some things I've learned as I've read the Bible. So, but do you have some suggestions of things getting in? Yes? I have a, a, a French foreign exchange student that's uh, with, been with us now for two years, and he's been, um, we've been reading the book of John together and the book of Acts and different things, and he's from a French, I mean, this uh, atheist, um, but he's really interested in learning the English language through the study of the Bible. <laughs> and uh, while he's reading the English language and, you know, getting pronunciation correctly, the word is getting in there. And then he's going to church with us and, you know, becoming involved in our, in my wife's and I, uh, life in every way, in our, in our uh, walk in faith. He still proclaims that he's an atheist, but all that word's in there, and I believe he got the word to right. transform him. Right, sure. Any other specific tools about getting people into the Bible? Yes. Understanding the Bible by John Stott. How about it? Yeah, a good one. Okay, there we go. That was good. <laughs> yes? I think biographies are good. If someone gets interested in a person and that person comes to faith, uh -huh. like Chuck Colson's Born Again, there are other ones like that. that right. Um, if, if you're a politician, Colson might be good. If you're an artist, I mean, there's a variety right. of other ones. Yes, right. um, good. That, this is the person I admire, and look where he ended up. So right. that takes you there. And, and by the way, what, what that does is, that's, I think that that's a form of engaging the imagination. Because it's, because those stories very often are not just telling what the person understood, but here's how it kind of worked out in their life. And oh, okay, I could see that. So yes, those are very good. You do want to read those before you give them to people and make sure that they're, you know, legit and, and not crazy at some points. So, uh, other thoughts? Yes? If you're working with a person that is perhaps marginally literate, um, uh, perhaps they're a child, so they're not going to be ready for some of the kinds of adult resources we've been talking about. There's a great series that came out of Japan called The Manga Messiah. It's uh, nothing but scripture in it. There are five volumes in it that cover all mm -hmm. the, the Bible. And each page has footnoted the actual place, the references for the scripture that's on that page in the manga comic book style. And uh, it's really a powerful tool to get a kid interested in scripture and then they'll go deeper because not all of the gospels is in Manga Messiah, but nothing but the gospel is in Manga Messiah. Great. Um, yeah, I want, um, well, I do want to move on, uh, but um, uh, I, I'm not so, uh, I think a, a much larger percentage of people are able to dig into the Bible without us helping them a whole lot. The, the Bible may be accessible to people if they can read, okay? Um, so uh, I, again, I just think the sooner we get there, um, it does clear away a bunch of other questions that people might have. Anyway, let me, let, let me uh, shift to, do you have any other questions, not necessarily suggestions of uh, written material, but other questions about this? Yes, sir. You mentioned the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew. Um, um, what are your thoughts on the Gospel of John as, as an entry book? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're... I'm just tempted to crack a joke of, no, <laughs> stay away from that book. Um, can we edit that out of the, uh, uh, oh, they're all great, and they are, but, but they are all different, and so it's worth knowing. Um, uh, for many people, John, I, I think John may be the, the best starting place for a very wide range of people, because it is um, a, a little bit more broader in its approach. 
Uh, Matthew was definitely writing for Jewish people who knew the Old Testament scriptures and wanted to show how that ties together. Um, Luke is a little bit more intellectually engaging, um, a little bit more for a Gentile audience, although there's still plenty of Jewishness in there. Luke brings a, a lot of different people into his story to engage that kind of, oh, this is what it would look like to be this kind of person and this kind of person. It's almost like this cast of characters he's bringing out. So I, I think they're all good, and I, I don't, I'm not so sure there's as wide a variety uh, with the people that we're talking to. I mean, if, uh, anyway, so I, I think they're all good. Um, uh, I think the sooner we can get them into the Gospels, um, the better. There are, there are certainly um, books that are easier for people to get into, you know. Um, Ezekiel could be a tough starting point for a lot of people. <laughs> But I'll tell you, I, I've heard some stories of, really, that worked? Because um, um, God can use anything in any way he wants. All right, I got time for one more, I think. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Um, how would you relate apologetics and evangelism? What's the relationship? Yeah, good question, yes. Well, I, I, uh, you could read lots and lots of discussions about this, by the way. I, I tend to think of apologetics in that pre-evangelism category. So it's a kind of pre-evangelism. It's convincing people or moving people from no, I don't believe this to hmm, maybe I should. Uh, it's moving people from I should really consider this. Um, so apologetics is pre-evangelism of building the case for why I should listen or consider this more um, seriously. Is that okay?